as always. We do have some announcements, thank you. Um, today is our Lord's Day, we are here to worship and welcome in it. Let me read from Hebrews 10. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of the Lord, the day of his return is drawing near. You know what a fitting time for um, the first as we come together, especially during Christmas times, but not everyone is joyous during Christmas and some people have some parties, but this is why we come together as a church to encourage one another and to pray for one another. And I want to appreciate and thank you all for, for coming and doing that. As always, we want to welcome those who are at home um, and we are praying and welcoming you today. Uh, look at your bulletin. There's some announcements in there. The one I want to point out, because I'm biased, is the men's Bible study. Uh, that's on Saturday, so all men are welcome to come uh, at 8 o'clock Saturday. And we always eat frozen donuts for some reason. So if that doesn't get you to come, I don't know what, what will. Um, what did Carrie have? It just says the, the dollar amount is between 20 and 40. We don't give any suggestions. The only thing is we, we, we know they, they should not have candles. They can't burn candles. And you kind of got to limit the candy for them. So. Um, and these are on the tree out there. Yeah, then the, there's a tag. There's a name and then their, their unit number. So make sure you return the tag with the, the present that you get. And they're due back on the 17th. And then over here we have... Um, a beautiful display. Thank you, Jen. Jen Swenson did that. Um, and it's for family photos. If you'd like to come in and take a family photo, it'll be up through the end of the month. Um, and it's just, I think I'm going to turn the light off when I walk over there and have it darkened. But that's for you to take advantage of and take photos if you'd like, if you'd like to just sit and relax, um, fall asleep. Melinda said if she sat over there, she'd fall asleep. Um, but you're welcome to use that, so thank you. But make sure you um, sign up to take, bless somebody at the Ashen House for, for Christmas. Yes. That's December 17th. Are you? Good. Okay. <laughs> Once again, this year's Jenny Singh from Join All Seasons is coming to our church. It'll be December 17th. That's a Sunday at 6 p.m. with concert and speaking. Yep. And then uh, there will be refreshments afterwards. It's in the bulletin, and then we'll have a flyer next week. And then we're going to have little bags for you to grab, and it'll be an invitation for your friends and family or anybody you meet that you'd like to have come to the concert and our Christmas service. So they'll have the information in there. And then a couple of goodies for them. So we'll have those next Sunday for you to grab. What a good team they are. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, for practice. <laughs> um, thank you for the decorations, Jen. This is amazing in here. I always appreciate you doing that. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, I was uh, asked to mention uh, yesterday during the women's thing, uh, there was a black coat. Um, oh, okay, we got it. <laughs> okay, I got it. So. There you go, Sandy. <laughs> so good. No need to further extend that. Um, as always, we want to walk you downstairs. We have treats and coffee, and uh, most importantly, fellowship. So please join us after after the sermon today, as we can uh, fellowship together. Let us let us pray. 
Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for this uh, day we can spend together, Lord. Uh, we shouldn't take any day for granted, Lord. Every day is a gift from you that you have given us, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this time. I thank you for my friends and my family and, my, and the loved ones here, Lord. For the power of prayer this church has towards Jesus. And give all things and glory to you. Lord, bless this time as we sing and worship and hear the word of, of, you, of the Lord, Jesus. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you please take your common worship insert and follow along as I read the call to worship? If you could please read in the bold print. All glory to you, great God, for the gift of your Son. Light in the darkness and hope of the world, whom you sent to save us. With singing angels, let us praise your name and tell his story, that all may believe, rejoice, and bow down in acknowledging your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's stand together as we prepare our hearts. We are starting our Advent lighting uh, time today, so we will start with singing Come Thou Long Expected.
the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forward. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And from Hebrews 1, 1 2, 3, we read, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Let's stand together again as we worship the Lord through song.
as you're seated, if you could take your insert again and follow along as I read. We preach the gospel to ourselves. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love, from Romans chapter 8. Let's bow our heads now for moments of personal silent confession. Lord, as we sit here this morning, we just come before you and ask you, Lord, to be the center of our hearts and minds. great to see you and to greet you on this first Sunday of Advent. Very thankful for, uh, for Jen and all of her work in decorating for the season and making it very special as we go through this Advent season and into Christmas. And I hope you'll take advantage either before or probably more likely after a, a service this month to 
utilize our, our photo area. Maybe we can find uh, one or two people who will be willing to serve as photographers, or, or of course you could, you could take your own. But again, thank you, Jen, for doing that. Now, it's such an appropriate song to sing as we begin this Advent season, and we're in everything that moves toward Christmas, to sing that song, Jesus, Be the Center. Because we really have to concentrate on, on that. There's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of good things. Individually, they're, they're, they're not bad. But there's a lot of things that can take our focus off of Jesus. And so I think that needs to be our prayer coming into this time. Jesus, be the center. So today, uh, beginning a, uh, a six-part series, an Advent Christmas series of messages and we get back into January, we're going to go back to our look at Deuteronomy and conclude that, that series. But this is entitled, Christmas Changes Everything. And we're going to start out today and next week at very, very wide, kind of like the top of a funnel. It's going to be very, very wide today. Um, Christmas Changes History. And then very wide next week, Christmas Changes How We Know God. But then we're going to narrow it down to, to individuals, some of the individuals who are there in the, in the, in the Christmas story. So we'll talk, how, we'll talk about how Jesus, how, how Christmas, how Christmas changes how we respond to God. Looking at the account of, of Mary and then Joseph. And then on the 24th in the morning, that Sunday morning, we'll be looking at Christmas changes those, Christmas changes those who seek and find. And then in our Christmas Eve worship, which will be at 5 p.m., Christmas changes those who wait in hope. So that's just to give you a heads up about where we're going to be going. Now this morning, two, two short texts. We're going to start over in the Gospel of, of Luke in the account that I'm sure you'll be hearing and will be reading probably a number of times over the course of this month the account of the birth of, of Jesus. So familiar, so familiar to us. And so just to back up a bit to verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, in Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He was there to be registered with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And then if you go over with me to Paul's letter to the Galatians, Galatians chapter 4, and looking at verse 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. May we bow together in prayer. Father, as we come into this season, we pray, O oh Lord, that indeed, Jesus, you would be at the center. May you be at the center of our thinking, at the center of our desires. May we see opportunities May we see opportunities and seize those opportunities to tell others about you, to share what the real gift of Christmas is, to talk about the difference you've made in our lives. We also know that for many people, this season of joy is, is mixed. It's a mixed season. For some, it's mixed with sorrow. For others, it's mixed with diff difficult problems. And sometimes just the very nature of this season seems to con compound the sorrow or the difficulties. So, Lord, for any and all who may be here in this room or those who may be watching and listening, if this is you, if, if this is where they are at, struggling with difficulties, I pray that this will be a time in which the light of the love of God, the light of your love, of your grace, of your compassion would flood into those lives. Now, Lord, as we are gathered in these moments, first to hear your word, and then to experience you, Lord Jesus, 
in your word demonstrated through the bread and the cup. We ask always that you would be glorified. We pray for the witness of the Holy Spirit to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There's a view of history that we have, that you and I have, that we simply take for granted. We just don't think about it in any way, any other way. We have a view of history that, that, that history has a beginning in the past and that it is moving forward. That history has a beginning in the past and it is moving forward into the future. And for us as Christians, we look at the culmination of history in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the consummation of the kingdom of God, in the, the new heavens and the new earth. We see it as moving towards that end. But everyone in the Western world has a view of history that says history is, is moving, it's linear, and it's moving forward. But in fact, that was not the way the ancients saw history. If you go back into the, the time of the Old Testament, the peoples, for example, surrounding Israel, the various tribes, the various nationalities, they had a very, and even into the time of the Greeks, they had a different view of history. They did not see history as linear, as moving forward in a direction. They saw it as cyclical. That what, what, what happens now goes on, goes on, and then it will repeat itself, repeat itself. And there, there's some of that in, in even today in the world, in, in Hinduism, that history is cyclical. It, it goes around, it's just con continuing circles. But where did that begin, that, that view, that history is linear, when that, was the, when, when, when that wasn't the view that people held in the ancient world? Well, it began with the Hebrews. It began with the Jews. And there's a, there's a marvelous little uh, book by a historian named Thomas Cahill called the, the, the Gifts of the Jews. And when I first read that book, I thought, okay, he's going to focus on monotheism belief in one God, which he talks about, but the first thing he actually brings out is this concept of history moving forward, being linear and moving forward begins with the Jews. And it begins with Abraham, and because God comes to Abraham and says, I'm making you these promises. I'm promising you that I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm promising you that your descendants will be as numerous as the stars of the sky. I'm, I'm promising you that through you all nations of the earth will be blessed. So, and what that does, it, it sets in motion a view of history that is moving forward, not cycling, but moving forward towards an end, towards a goal. And then as you go on farther in the New Testament, you see that even being expanded through the prophets who look ahead to a future time, to a time of the kingdom of God, to a messianic kingdom on, on earth. So you and I have a view of history that we take for granted, but actually has its origins in the, in, in the far distant past with the Hebrews, starting with, with Abraham. And then we also, as, particularly as Christians, we, we know, and we need to be reminded of this from time to time, that we know a God who, who reigns over history. Not only is our view that history is moving forward to a consummation, but we know a God who reigns over history. He is sovereign over all of history. Indeed, he says of himself in Isaiah chapter 46, my purposes will stand. I will do all that I please. You see, we, we, we know and we worship and we are in relationship with a God who is beyond history. He's beyond time. He dwells in eternity. But he is sovereign over all of history. It is not like a wild train running, running down the track. It is all under his control. History, when we look into the biblical story, starting back, way back into Genesis, history was moving toward the coming of Jesus. History was moving toward the coming of Jesus 4,000 years ago. God gave his promises to a Middle Eastern pagan moon worship, a pagan man worshiping a moon god named Abraham in Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. 
He gave his promises that he would make of his descendants a great nation, that through him all the peoples of the earth would be blessed. 600 years later, moving linearly, 600 years later, God raised up Moses to lead his people to the promised land. Moses lives that very long life. God begins to use him at 80. He dies in 120. He died still waiting for the promises to be fulfilled. Then once they arrive in the promised land, 450 years later, David became king. And God promised to David a, a, a king that would come, a kingdom that would come through one of his descendants, and that kingdom would last forever. But David died waiting for that. The nation of Israel was split in two 400 years later after the death of David. The nation of Israel was split in two. And in that time following that, prophets like, like Isaiah, through prophets like Isaiah, God promised to send the Messiah. And Messianic prophecy really, really kicks in in that period in the latter part of the, of the Old Testament where prophecy after prophecy points ahead to a, to a servant who will suffer and to a king who will reign. When we come into the New Testament, we find that those two come together in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, 700 years later, after Isaiah and those messianic prophecies, God fulfilled, God fulfilled the, promise, the promises of Jesus in his coming on that first Christmas day. Over a period of 2,000 years, history was moving toward the coming of Jesus. And you see, in that, in that movement of history, God prepared the historical setting of Jesus' coming. God prepared the historical setting of Jesus' coming. You see, in, 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 in the New Testament, I'm going to back up a little bit to, to kind of set the stage for this. In, in the New Testament, we have two different concepts of time. So, if you have a watch and it has a second hand, if you just take a look at that second hand, <coughs> And you can see it counting off, moving five seconds, and then ten seconds. Well, the Greek New Testament word for that, that kind of time is, is chronos. It's, it's time moving forward, moving forward by seconds, moving forward by minutes, moving forward by hours, by, by days, by weeks, by years. That's that's usually the common way that we think about time. It's chronos, it's time moving forward. We get our word uh, chronology from that. But there's another word that's used in the New Testament for time, and that's the Greek word kairos. And kairos do doesn't mean time as a, as a progression moving forward. Kairos means an opportune time, an opportune time or a, or a, a season of time. An opportune time or a season of time that has arrived. So, for example, in Mark 1, when Jesus comes on the scene, he says, he says, the time, the time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Or in the very well-known birth narrative of Jesus from Luke chapter 2, as Luke is, uh, is unfolding that they had to make, the census was commanded. The census was commanded by Caesar, and because of that, they had to go to Bethlehem. And then while they're in Bethlehem, we read in Luke, in Luke 2, 6, that the, the time came. The time came for her birth. It was the opportune time. It was the time for that birth to take place. That's a kairos moment, an opportunity moment. But I want us especially to pay attention to the way Paul uses this in Galatians 4 and verse 4. He says, when, when the time had fully come. And that little expression in our Bible, the, the time had fully come, is, is kairos. Kairos. When the kairos time had come, when the kairos moment had come, when it was the opportune time, when it was the set season for Jesus to come, is when he came. 
so we need to pay attention to that for a few moments. In, in the fullness of time, it was the right time. This is such an amazing thing, and this is a good thing to, for you to grasp and to, and to share with someone who's you know, skeptical about Christianity or skeptical about Jesus, and just to, just to understand what Paul is saying, that when Jesus came, it was the fullness of time. It was the opportune time. Let me point out about four ways that it was exactly that. First of all, it was the right time historically. It was the right time historically. It was the right time historically because it was the time of the Roman Empire. What, what was the importance of that? Because it was the time of the Roman Empire, there was a good system of roads all over that area. So when the apostles begin to go out in the book of Acts, they can travel in relative safety over roads over a vast distance. Now, a couple hundred years before this, that did not exist. And later in history, it would not exist. But at that time, under the Roman Empire, there was a good system of roads, and those roads were protected throughout the Roman Empire by garrisons of Roman soldiers. You could travel an enormous amount of distance on those roads, which would enable the, the apostles to travel very easily to bring the message of the gospel. At that time, there was also across the vastness of the Mediterranean world, there was a, it, it was a time of peace and stability. Historians call it the Pax Romana. There were no wars. There were no, there were no major conflicts. So when the church is born, it's born in a time unique, unique in history. It, again, it, would, it didn't exist 200 years later, uh, 200 years before, a few hundred years later it would collapse. But this is a time of peace. This is a time where you can go out, you can travel, churches can be established. It's not happening during a period of conflict. Secondly, in the fullness of time, it was that opportune time because of a universal language. Universal language. Do you realize that in the, at, the, at the time of Jesus, you could go anywhere, including Palestine, where Jesus was born. You could go anywhere in the Roman world. You could go up into Asia Minor, where most of the churches would be established later, or over to Italy or across North Africa, and you could speak one language and people would understand it. And that was because a few hundred years earlier, Alexander the Great came on the scene had a vast conquest and established the Greek language. Alexander was long gone, his empire was gone, but the Greek language remained as the language of trade and commerce. So those, those men, those disciples of Jesus in Palestine, in, in the most remote area of the Roman Empire, in addition to their native language, which, which was Aramaic, they would know Greek. So the New Testament can be written in Greek, and it can be spread all over the Roman world. You see, it was in the fullness of time. It was the right time nationally. It was the right time nationally. Because Israel, the nation of Jesus' birth, although it had a significant population still, in, in its ancient land, which was now Roman Palestine, it still had a significant population. Actually, at the time of Jesus' birth, most of the Jews in the world were not dwelling in Palestine. They were dispersed over the Roman Empire. And so this would mean that when the apostles would go out, they could go to people who had the same background as they did. They could go to people who shared that in common. They could go to people who knew the scripture of the Old Testament and the promises. In the fullness of time, at the opportune time, God sent forth his son, and fourthly, it was the right time spiritually. It was the right time in spiritually because in among the nation of Israel, both in the land and scattered out, dispersed in the Roman world, it was a time of strong, strong messianic longing. The longing for Messiah was very, very strong. The expectation that maybe the promised one, promised centuries ago in the Old Testament, would come. There was, a, there was an expectation among the Jewish people 
of a messianic longing. And also because historians tell us that in the Roman world of that day, there was a kind of spiritual emptiness. In the Roman world, there was a kind of spiritual emptiness. John R. Scott, great biblical commentator, makes this observation. The, the old mythological gods of Greece and Rome were losing their hold on the common people so that the hearts and minds of men everywhere were hungry for a religion that was real and satisfying. This is why when the apostles go and they speak to this pagan Greek and Roman audience, there, there's actually in many, many cases, there, there's an openness because there was a kind of a spiritual vacuum there. The old gods, the old gods, the old mythologies were not dripping the hearts and minds of the people the way they once did. So, is this all coincidental? Is this all coincidental that it was the right time and uniquely, is historically and linguistically and language and nationally and spiritually, is, is it just kind of all, you know, kind of a happy coincidence? No, as Paul says, it was the fullness of time. It was, at, it was the divinely designed, divinely set moment for the Son of God to come. And then history testifies to the ways Jesus' coming changed history. Get this. History testifies to the ways the coming of Jesus changed history. It made, it made history going forward different. The coming of Jesus through his birth, his life, his death, and especially his resurrection, changed the coming history. You see it starting in the book of Acts. You see it starting in the book of Acts as the apostles go out and they begin to bring this message of, of Christ who lived and died and rose again and by his death redeem, redeems people for God. And, and, and the effect of the gospel going out that we begin to see in the book of Acts is barriers breaking down. The, 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 the almost insurpassably high wall between Jews and Gentiles began to come down. And so Paul could write to a predominantly Gentile church in Ephesus and say, because now in that church there were also Jews as, as well as Gentiles, he says, God has torn down, God has torn down the middle wall between us, and he is made of the two one, Jews and Gentiles, he has made them one. And that, that ethnic, racial, Barrier came down. Barriers of gender began to come down. Women who were suppressed and seen as almost less than human, who had no rights, the status of women began to change. Because again, in the church, the message was in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond or, bond or free, male and female. I came across an article actually from December 2021, a wonderful woman uh, writer, very brilliant communicator, her name is Tish Harrison Warren, and she is a, uh, she's actually an evangelical Anglican, she's an evangelical Anglican, a group of people who have broken away from the Episcopal Church in America. And she actually writes on the opinion page of the, of the New York Times. And periodically, they, they run a, a piece. And it's always dealing with uh, issues of religion and, and Christianity. But her, her piece on December 26, 2021, was how Christmas changed everything. No, I didn't take the title of the series from that. But I was happy when I found, when I found this article. And I'm not going to read all of it, but it's a, extremely well written talking about how Christmas changed everything. He said, she writes, if, if you live in the Western world, the claims, of Chris, the claims of Christmas have profoundly shaped your life and view of the world. You don't have to believe in Jesus or even think about him for that to be true. The West is so saturated in Christian assumptions that it's almost impossible to remove ourselves from them, said Tom Holland, a British historian and author of Dominion, how the Christian Revolution remade the world. 
He continued, we tend to take for granted that the lowest of the lowest do have dignity. She goes on to write, before the Christian revolution, nearly all ancient societies were essentially caste systems. In these societies, different levels of social status reflected inherent differences of being. The ideas of those like Aristotle that certain groups were, quote, natural slaves, intrinsically inferior, and made to be dominated, were widespread. Jesus was born into a Roman world where might made right, to be a slave or a woman, to have a disability, or to be a, racially, a racial or religious minority was to lack dignity and value as a matter of fact in nature. The story of Jesus represented in the words of 7th century theologian Maximus the Confessor, quote, a wholly new way of being human. Therefore, because of Jesus and because of Christianity, dignity is not reserved to only one nationality, gender, or class. Rather, the human body is a holy thing to be protected no matter whose body it is, and the value of the weak is more important than the prerogatives of the powerful. And she goes on to, to flesh this out even more. If you'd like a copy of this article, I'd be glad to, to give it to you. But, but the point is, what I'm using this to emphasize is that history testifies. History itself testifies to the ways Jesus' coming changed history. And it's, it, it's not something that we just sort of automatically know, but if we do a little research, if we do a little digging, if, if we look back at the, you know, the history of the world in which we live, the, the Western world, and even for people who don't even think about Jesus at all and maybe consider themselves to be totally secular, but in fact, the world in which they live and many of the things they take for granted, like concepts like equality or the dignity of every human person, concepts like that, did not arise by some process of social evolution. They came as the direct influence of Christianity and the message of Jesus. History testifies to the ways Jesus' coming changed history. And we could go on, you could talk about many examples of you could talk about how the abolition of slavery came about. You could talk about how the, 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 the treatment of, of orphans came about. There, there's just countless ways in which you can see major changes that have taken place for the better in history that came, came about precisely because of the influence of Christianity. But we want to bring it down to this. My point today is that, the point of the sermon is that Christmas changes history. But we have to conclude with this question. What about your history? What about your history? Has Jesus come into your history? As you look at the history of your life, those of you sitting in this room or those of you we're watching. As you look back at the history of your life, can you say, you know what? There was a point in time in which Jesus Christ came into my life, and from that point on, the history of my the history of my life changed. There was a point in which Jesus Christ came into my life because I heard the gospel message and I knew that I was a needy person. I was a sinner in need of a Savior. And I turned from my sin and unbelief and repentance and I turned in faith to receive Christ as my Savior and to submit to Him as my Lord. And from that point on, my history has been rewritten. What about your history? Paul reminds us in that text the reason why Jesus came in Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem. To redeem. To buy out of slavery those who were under the law's condemnation. That's the, that's the, the meaning of that phrase, under the law. Those who were under laws, the law's condemnation. Those who were bent down with guilt, the weight of guilt, the weight of shame, the slavery, the bondage of sin. 
Jesus came to set slaves free. Jesus came to set people free who are in bondage to sin, to shame, to guilt. He came to redeem. He came at the right time. But has he come into your history? And then the other part of that would be just to ask, how is the history, how is he changing the history of your life right now? How is he changing the history, the history of your life right now, day by day, as you follow him? Because the Christian life has a beginning. There, there must be a beginning, that beginning point of faith in Jesus. But the Christian life is a walk with Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple, to walk with Jesus. Well, how is he changing the history of your life today? Father, thank you. We praise you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came. Christmas, indeed, changes history. The coming of Jesus has changed history, Lord, in ways that most people don't even think about. But for those who know you, for those who have received you, let us think about it. Let us think about how Christmas, the coming of Jesus into the world, is coming to be the Savior and the Redeemer. How has that Christmas message changed us? How has it changed our history? How is it changing it today? Thank you, Lord. Let's stand together as we prepare our hearts this morning to take the news, worshiping the Lord again through song.
fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And in a very real sense, all, all of history was preparing for that moment. And in a very real sense, all of history was preparing for what we are doing right now. All of history was preparing for God's Son to come into the world to be the Redeemer, to be the rescuer of those who put their faith and trust in Him. By means of His death on the cross, all of history was preparing us for this table because this, this table is speaking to us of what Christ did in history 2,000 years ago. But more than calling us to look back to what Christ did 2,000 years ago in giving his body, his life to redeem us and his, his blood to purchase our salvation, more than just having us look back to that event, this table is reminding us that present, right now in history, right now, Jesus is with us. And that when we come to this table, the very elements of it point us back to what he did and what he gave, but at the same time, as we're taking those elements into our bodies physically, we are enjoying fellowship with him. He is present with us. That's why Paul says when we take this, this is a, this is a communion with Christ. We are communing with him. What a priceless privilege. We look, we look back, we remember what we did as we right now. in our personal history. If you confess the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord, you seek to follow him in your life, we, we invite you to participate. As we read again the, the text that gives us direction for this. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. <coughs> if you would open the, the portion that contains bread. Take that piece of bread. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son that in the fullness of time he came. He came into the world. He lived. He inaugurated the kingdom of God. He taught. He prepared apostles to take the message out into the then he laid down his life as the once for all sacrifice for our sins. Atonement through his blood. Bless this bread to us now, Lord, and we give this. The body of Christ. Jesus, you came to redeem in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, you came to redeem a people purchased through your blood from every race, from every tribe, from every nation. And through your blood, we have redemption and forgiveness of our sins. Through your blood, we are made one. And we thank you. The blood of Christ. came in history, and the Apostle Paul adds these words, and he says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, past history, 
we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The direction of history is moving. Every second, every moment, every hour, every day, draw is one step closer to the return of the Lord Jesus and the consummation of the kingdom of God. Now our deacons will be at the back as with an offering plate as they do every time we have communion. And if you are prepared to give for the benevolent offering that is always appreciated and goes to enable our deacons to help in various needs that people may have uh, throughout, throughout the year. And of course, we invite you to join us downstairs if you're able to for refreshments and fellowship. Now, would you stand with me? As we receive the Lord's benefit, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.